Begin sermon time this morning. I have a title I want you to read, <laughs> as if you never do. Buy the truth, sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. I don't know about you, but I think that's good, sound advice. But I have a question. Is that all it is? Is that all that we can think of when we read this statement, that it is truly just sound advice, take it or leave it, advice? <laughs> I think most of us know the answer to that question as we think about the title and what we remember about it. First of all, we will find it in the Bible, of course. It's a biblical statement and it's found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 23 and verse 23. So we'll read that together. Solomon said, buy the truth and sell it not. Get wisdom and instruction and understanding. So when looking at this statement, we think, okay, I can understand it in the Old Testament, but it's a part of wisdom literature of the Old Testament. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is God saying this to us through the wisdom of Solomon. And so it's more than just advice. <laughs> it's, it's about Bible instruction. It's a part of what God tells us to do. It's found in the Old Testament, but we're gonna see in just a few minutes that it has a New Testament application. So where are we going with this statement this morning? Well. I want to make this as beneficial as I possibly can. You know, in recent months, we have tried to be very selective in sermon subjects that are as relevant and as helpful in the present time, in the present day, as we possibly can. This is another one of those. This meets that criteria. And I believe you'll see that and feel it as beneficial as we progress into our look at this statement this morning. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes, I invite you to participate with me as we continue bowing before the throne of God and worshiping God and preaching the word, is we're gonna go back into the Old Testament and take a look. We're not just gonna lift this out of its place, we're gonna keep it in its place and understand it as God wrote it. And then on the other end, we're gonna make a New Testament application. I want us to know how this applies to New Testament Christians. But in the middle, we'll try to explain what this means. How am I supposed to do that? Uh, what meaning does that have for me as a Christian? So as we look at its setting in Proverbs, what we mean by that, of course, is if you open your Bible, and you read the book of Proverbs, reading the word of God, you'll be greatly benefited. But we find this statement, its setting is in the book of Proverbs. But we have to narrow that down a little bit, and we do that by recognizing that Proverbs is divided into parts. And there's a section that is called sayings of the wise. That's what, of course, a proverb is, but this section has that identity. And that part is Proverbs chapter 22, verse 17, extending through chapter 24 and verse 22. If you're reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version, it actually has a number in the text. Those translators discerned a number in the original Hebrew, and instead of saying just wise sayings, it's 30 wise sayings. We're not counting today, but you may take note of that as you read that passage in the future, and depending on which translation that you read. But I want us to take the beginning of this section. We're not gonna read this section in its entirety. Obviously, time will not permit us to do that in a sermon time, but I'd like for us to read what is normally called the prologue, or the beginning, the introduction of this section of the book of Proverbs. Incline your ear, Solomon said, and hear the words of the wise, 
and apply your mind to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you, that they may be ready on your lips, so that your trust may be in the Lord. I have taught you today, even you. Have I not written for you excellent sayings of counsels and knowledge to make you know the certainty of the words of truth that you may correctly answer to him who sent you? So Solomon is simply expressing what he has written here and in the book of Proverbs by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He calls wise words, words of the wise, excellent sayings of counsels and knowledge, but they have a purpose so that when you learn them, you can go and tell others, and what you tell others is in your mind certain words of truth. But there's a verse in this I'd like for us to circle and emphasize because in our Wednesday evening adult class, we've been studying building trust as a project for building us better Christians. The last project has been trust. And so this passage has that in it, and so there's a dovetailing between this and that lesson in learning to build trust in God. But I want us to note here simply that Solomon is saying, I'm writing these things to you. I want you to have them in your mind so well that they can be on your lips, you can be talking about them, so that your trust may be in the Lord. So that gives a strong indication as to what you and I can do to build trust in God. And it's consistent with other teachings in the Bible. But the saying of the wise of our interest in this whole section is, of course, a smaller section. And it's found in chapter 23, in verses 22, 23, 24, and 25. And you remember our text is just the 23rd verse. But let's read this section in its entirety. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 22. Solomon said, listen to your father who begat you and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice and he who begets a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and your mother be glad and let her rejoice who gave birth to you. Some of us have parents who have already passed on. But we take notice anyway that while this applies to all of us in one way or another, what this proverb is teaching is giving wisdom, words of the wise, on the best way to honor parents. And the specific instruction in these verses have to do with listening, taking heed, do not despise your mother when she gets older. We never despise old age in anyone, hopefully. But the father of the righteous, the father who raises a righteous son or daughter, will rejoice in them. Of course, that's a wonderful thing. And your father and your mother will be glad and let her rejoice who gave birth to you. So these are some instructions that are intended to help all of us honor our parents, whether living in the present or in the past, we can still honor their name. But we recognize that the heart of this passage, the heart of it, is verse 23. By truth, some translations have the article the. It doesn't change the meaning. And do not sell it. And sell it not. And so that is the setting in Proverbs. It's a part of the wisdom of the Old Testament. It makes it an instruction from the Word of God 
to give us guidance according to God's wisdom in our life to do what he wants us to do to be pleasing in his sight by the truth and sell it not. So what does that mean? If you read that in the Bible and you're sitting down reading your Bible one day and you come across Proverbs 23, verse 23, okay, uh, uh, let me think about that a minute. So let's do that together. Let's think about this just a minute. And first of all, emphasize the first part of it. By the truth. We'll leave the word truth in its setting here for just a moment. I'll be more specific in that and just further down the page. But let's note the instruction mainly is you buy the truth. But of course what that means in biblical language is just simply you take possession of it. You get it and you make it your possession. It speaks of it figuratively, figuratively as a purchase, a buying, but that's what we're to do. But inherent in the language is that we're to spare no expense. This is the one thing you've got to do in your life. Whatever else you do, you must buy the truth. Because that's the only way anyone, families, sons, daughters, parents, and all of that were brought out in this setting in the book of Proverbs, finds the happiness and the adjustments that are needed for a happy, productive life. So to spare no expense, do whatever it takes. That's what Solomon is instructing. Let's don't think that this takes a debit card or cash. That's not what this is talking about. This is not something we can buy with cash or on Amazon or at the mall or wherever it may be. It is simply a figure of speech using the concept that we're all familiar with. Spend whatever you need to spend, however much it takes to do whatever you have to do to make truth your possession. Well, that's pretty clear. That's pretty direct. And I'll suggest to you at this point, do not ever think of that as optional. That is not an option for your life. That is a requirement. That is a mandatory instruction. But the other part of it is, once you have bought the truth, sell it not. Is that necessary? Yeah, it really is. And what this means is never put the truth up for sale, no matter what. It's not to be sold for the expense of something else. You think about if I think of the tr truth and I understand what the truth is and I do what it takes to make it my possession. And somewhere down the road, I feel like, well, it's getting kind of old and worn out like my car, so I need to trade it in. <laughs> need to buy a new one. Whatever may be my reasoning or thinking about replacing something old or I feel is antiquated or outdated with something better or newer. And so I've bought the truth and so along comes a doctrine, wow, that is really attractive. That just, there are so many people believing that, and it's so compelling. Okay, what, what am I going to do? Well, I can't have the truth and that, because that's not the truth. <laughs> so in order to have that, what people have done, what people are doing this very day, is to sell the truth in order to buy the other doctrine. We'll have some specific examples of that in just a moment, but that's what this passage means. That's the instruction. Buy the truth. Think of it in terms of what you need to spend. You need to spend the time. You need to put forth the effort. You need to do whatever it takes. You need to buy yourself a good Bible. You need to have good study aids. You need to be able to look into the Word of God and possess the truth and never never 
sell it for anything else. Well, let's make that New Testament application. How does this apply to New Testament Christianity? I would suggest, and we know, that the wisdom in the Word of God in the Old Testament is applicable for His people of all time. And so we look at this statement, buy the truth and sell it not, in the New Testament setting. But as you pick up your New Testament and you realize this is the setting in which this is found for you. What is the application? Well, the obvious most first application I think we should make exactly what is the truth that you want to buy. <laughs> There's a lot of confusion about this in the religious world, I'll tell you. Because it is thought, well, everything's the truth, isn't it? Anybody with good sense knows <laughs> that's not true. And you can't take something that's false and because you have a good sense of heart, it becomes true. That's not true either. So what is it exactly that we're buying when we buy the truth? We know what it means to buy any object that we desire, that we've been shopping for. We know what that object is. We zero in on it. We budget for it. We, we do what it takes so what is this? Well, I'm going to answer this question on a way that you and I can know for certain, by faith, what it is that we are to buy. Jesus said in John 17, 17, in this prayer, he said, as he prayed to God, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. So Jesus identified it right off in that prayer as the Word of God. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 5, and in verse 17, we have uh, 14, we have a similar statement. And read chapter 2, verse 5 with me. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. So Paul writes about the truth a number of times. He doesn't refer to it in the same way every time. He's referring to the same body of doctrine. But here he calls the truth the gospel. So we know that's true. That's, that's what I thought, <laughs> that the truth, when it comes to New Testament setting, is the gospel of Christ. It is the New Testament. It is the New Covenant. Well, let's look further. In James chapter 1, verse 18, we learn that it is the seed of our begettal. It is our spiritual father's seed that he uses to beget us as his children. James said, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. This is referenced a number of times, how God begat you to be one of his children, to be his son or his daughter. What is the seed that the Father used to beget you? Every time, it's exactly the same. And here James refers to it as the word of truth that he used to bring us forth. But further, the Apostle Peter even refers to the truth and identifies it as what is obeyed to become a Christian. So you see, we're not, we're not giving a confusing set of definitions here. All of this, if you will notice, is in perfect harmony and agreement as they are brought together. So this truth that is God's word, that is the gospel of Christ, that is the seed of our begettal, is what, it, what you obeyed to become a Christian. The Apostle Peter made reference to this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Speaking to them, he said, for since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. So they obeyed something, you obeyed something, and in obedience to that something, you purified your soul. Never underestimate the value of having purified your soul and keeping it pure. 
But our point here this morning is, it was in their obedience to something, and it's as plain as day. Even the young people, the youngest who can read, can read this passage and understand that Peter said, since you have an obedience to the truth, so this is the truth that you must buy, that I must buy. It's that body of doctrine that is identified as the gospel, the New Testament, the New Covenant, that requires obedience, and when we obey it, we become a Christian, we purify our souls by the blood of Christ, by our obedience through faith, for a sincere love of the brethren. But it doesn't stop there, does it? It's followed as a Christian in order to go to heaven. One of the parts of the New Testament, I, I spoke recently from the epistle of Jude and referred to how rarely we look at the book of Jude uh, for sermons, lessons. But so it is with 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. We need to read those once in a while. We need to teach and preach from them once in a while. We're not going to do that in its entirety today, but one thing that John did in the second epistle, he's writing to the elect lady and her children, and he has referred to truth several times in the first three verses. And he said to her, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. So they had received commandment from God to do something as faithful Christians. And John is writing to this elect lady and her children, saying, I was happy, I was glad, I rejoiced to find some of your kids, some of your children walking in truth. Well, what did that mean? That meant they were living faithful lives of Christianity. But to do that, what were they doing? Uh, walking in truth. So think about it. That's what you're to buy, the truth. That body of doctrine that you have to walk in, live by, be guided by every day to go to heaven. That's a pretty good purchase. It's the teaching that is personified in Jesus. I bet you thought I forgot this. It's at the bottom, but not forgotten. Referenced in class this morning was John 14, verse 6. When Jesus told the apostles in this chapter that he was going to leave them, and he told them, you'll know the way to follow me. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do you expect us to know the way? <laughs> well, you know what Jesus said? unto him, unto Thomas, I am the way. But he didn't stop there, did he? I am the truth. I am the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. So our point here is, as Jesus was nearing the time of his death and ascension back to heaven, he was identifying himself as the personification in him as the person that represented it all. The only way to get to the Father, the only source of life, but you will notice he said, I am the truth. You look at me, you see the truth. I am the embodiment of the truth. And there's none found anywhere else for religious purposes. So when we buy the truth, we're buying what Jesus personified. The body or system of doctrine that he, of course, taught, revealed, and gave unto us. So that's what we're to buy. And I, I hope you agree with me that it's, it's a good purchase. Well, I'll find a better, and we better all of us. How are you doing on this? Are you buying the truth? Buying what is represented in this expression, 
in the New Testament application. But I have a question. It's happening, it has happened, it is happening, and it will continue to happen. People who have the truth sell it. I actually sell it. They do what this wise saying says not to do. They actually do it. So our question is, what is for sale today? That Christians might sell the truth in order to buy. What is it that people can see that they're willing to tell the, sell the truth for? Well, you say, well, surely there's nothing out there. Well, <laughs> we all know better than that. We know better than that. This list could be infinite. We could answer this in such generic terms that we could say anything and everything that Satan throws at us, he throws some enticing, some allurements that sometimes people just can't resist. <laughs> I've got to have that. And so they're willing to sell the truth for that. So this list could be very general. And let's say that because anything that Satan throws at you that makes appealing and alluring enticement to you is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour, giving you one of his special wiles and schemes in order to get you to sell the truth. One of those is so much before us in this permissive, immoral world in which we live. Sinful pleasure. And much time could be spent describing that most know what that's referring to. Any kind of sinful pleasure. Anything that Satan puts that appeals to the, to the eyes, the sight, vainglory of life. Those three avenues, 1 John 2.15. He can entice you through what you see. He can entice you through all of these avenues. But as we look at the religious world today, we see the enticement of secularized religion. We see the popular churches, the big mega churches, building their mega church buildings. And you go into those services and they have entertainment. They have bowling alleys, basketball courts, rock groups performing for worship. So what has happened to make religious religion more appealing to people is let's set aside the spiritual aspect and let's put in some secular stuff. <laughs> so secularized religion, a lot could be said about that. Acceptance of subjectivism. This is a age of subjectivism. What I feel in my heart is the most important thing to me ever. And so that becomes the precedent for determining the direction of life, the values. Don't worry about objective truth. Don't worry about the specific words on the page of the Bible. What I feel in my heart is more important. And we will see examples of this every day. The acceptance of that as the rule of thumb. Angry, violent persuasion has become the rule of the day. Anger. I'm going to control you by my anger. I'm going to control you by my violence. I'm going to make you believe and think and act like I want you to act in this religious world. And that's even found sometimes in the lives of Christians. Civil law superseding the Bible. Think how many laws our legislation has passed that are against what the Bible teaches. And there's a very popular feeling among a lot of people, even some Christians have fallen victim. Well, if it's the law, if it's in the law books, if our Congress and legislation, our House and Senate, and even on the local basis, 
has made it legal, it must be okay. So all of a sudden, truth is sold for legal law. Same-sex marriage. I have lost count of how many states have that as law now. Abortion. There have been some changes in that. It's, it's where it should be after doing away with the Roe versus Wade law, the thing that was canceled, put it back into the hands of states, which means we have a right to vote on it. We have some control, but still it's the popular vote that wins the elections. And now the argument is, okay, abortion, but to what extent? Heartbeat, full term, and just recently, if we've been watching the news much at all, we've heard some debate on that among some of the candidates. But civil law does not supersede the Bible. We cannot sell the truth for civil law. We obey the civil law, but we're taught in Acts 4, we must obey God rather than men. So whenever there is a contrast, God wants us to do one thing and civil law wants us to do another, we do what God wants us to do, breaking, if we have to, the civil law. Christians have done that from the very beginning, but we must not sell the truth just to keep or honor a civil law. Popular eschatology. I've got in parentheses there in a small word what that's referring to. You'll see the word eschatology in the newspaper. You'll see it on the TV and other sort. What that's referring to is the doctrine for the end times. What people are teaching about how the world is going to end, how this earth is going to come to an end. I have been watching the news recently and all of a sudden there was a TV commercial by David Jeremiah who is one of the most popular advocates of one of the most popular doctrines on this matter today. And there are people who are selling the truth in order to accept what he's teaching. He's got a book he's promoting and trying to sell to all of us. And it will advance in some form or another dispensationalism, premillennialism, the thousand year reign upon the earth, back in Jerusalem, that's why there's so much interest in the nation of Israel because it's still God's play. Uh, they're still a sovereign nation, but the children of Israel are not God's chosen people in this Christian dispensation any more than we Americans who are Christians. But the end times is that He's going to come to the earth. He's going to sit upon the throne in the city of Jerusalem and reign a thousand years. Then it's going to be the battle of Armageddon. You see, these are words that I know all of us have heard. They're, they're popular uh, beliefs. But I tell you, the Bible does not teach that. Believe me, the Bible does not teach any of that. That is a fabricated system of religion, <laughs> theology that has been started in several places of academia in the theological schools in this country. And we cannot sell the truth to buy that false doctrine. Buy the truth and sell it not. Well, more agreeable doctrine. I, <laughs> this kind of becomes a subjective, but I tell you, there's a lot of my faith only is pretty agreeable. All you got to do is believe, give mental assent, you're in. I see TV commercials on that. The once saved, always saved doctrine. That fifth element, tenet of Calvinism believed by so many people today and sometimes even by Christians. And what it says is, once saved, always saved. Once you're saved, there's nothing at all you can do to be lost. 
that's pretty agreeable. <laughs> I become a Christian, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want, and I'll never be lost again. Pretty agreeable. A lot of people sell the truth for that, but the problem is that's not the truth. The Bible does not teach that. A liberalized church. In the 1940s, 1950s, 60s, and on, even until today, there's been a movement among some who wear the name Church of Christ tending toward liberalism. It's in the church as well as in other religious organizations. And what that means is simply that we have a group of people that are willing to go outside the scriptures, outside scriptural authority, and do what the Bible does not teach or what the head of the church has not authorized done. And therefore, it's a more liberal understanding and interpretation. And so in recent decades, in recent years, we have seen a tendency toward liberalization. You know, I know that we have done our best to stand against that in this place. Not that we're perfect, not <laughs> that we think we're above and holier than, but it's what we try to do is to buy the truth and not sell it out to liberalism. For there's a lot of people find that attractive. A lot of people think, well, that's kind of the thing. It involves sometimes education, it involves medicine, it involves a lot of social gospel stuff. Well, all of that's good in its place, but the point is that the Lord didn't put it in his church. <laughs> so we have to toe the line. And so there are a lot of things, that list could go on, but I, I, I have another question I wanna ask, and I want us to realize there are consequences of selling the truth. I'm going to go through these in order that we might be able to be impressed with what the New Testament teaches. We would suggest, first of all, it puts one in error, needing brought back, needing converted. This is one of the very sobering passages. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. He said, my brethren, if any among you, some of you brethren, err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he who converts a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall cover a multitude of sins. Now, could any honest Bible reader read that and think that that Christian who has erred from the truth is saved, always saved, once saved? No way. I mean, it couldn't be any plainer. This Christian among brethren, one of them, or more of them, erred from the truth. In other words, sold out the truth. He's a sinner, needing converted. And when he is converted, the person who is instrumental in doing that has saved a soul from death. Not eternal life, but from death. And shall cover a multitude of sins. Selling the truth overthrows faith. Paul said to Timothy, and their word will eat as doth a gangrene, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth of erred, saying the resurrection is past already, overthrow the faith of some. You get the picture. In the church where Timothy was, in the church at Ephesus, Paul names two individuals. He names them. Timothy, these are two individuals you have to be concerned about. Their teaching spreads like a, a cancer. Their names are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Well, what have they done? They've sold the truth about the resurrection for a false doctrine. They taught the brethren that it's already happened. The resurrection has passed already. But our point at the very last line they were overthrowing faith of people. Accursed. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. There are several things from Bible class this morning. Rick was teaching about the two builders that dovetails with some of these principles. 
Galatians chapter 1, where Paul said that we are an angel from heaven should preach unto you any gospel other than that which we preached unto you, let him be anathema. Again, none of us need help in understanding that. The word anathema in, in some translations, accursed in other translations, means under a curse. The curse is eternal damnation. And so those who have taught or sold the truth for another body of truth, thought to be the truth, another gospel, Paul's already said there's not another, for any gospel other than that which you know to be the true gospel that we preach to you. Then what is it? Their hand gets slapped. They get a firm rebuke. No, they're anathema, accursed. Take seriously. They have not God. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching of Christ hath not God. He that abides in the teaching, the same hath both the Father and the Son. There are serious consequences to leave the teaching, to sell the truth, and go to something else. John says, they have not God. Vain worship. Matthew 15, 9, this is from the teaching of Christ as he quotes Isaiah. He said, but in vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines the precepts of men. Selling the truth to teach the doctrines of men. We worship. We're sincere. We're honest. Doesn't matter. In vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines the precepts of men. The consequence of teaching the doctrines of men is vain worship. Worship that God will not accept. And then walking by sight. Well, that sounds right. Wait a minute. Let's don't get confused on that. No, let's follow what Paul said in Galatians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. We walk by faith, by what we can't see, by our conviction in what is in the spiritual world that we cannot see. That's what we walk by, not by our five senses. But when we sell the truth, we're no longer walking by faith, we're walking by sight. Much more, as you know, could be said about these, but we're back to where we started, thankfully. <laughs> but I have a couple of exhortations to those who aren't Christians. Buy the truth and become a Christian. That's what it takes. And what we mean by that is from your faith in Christ after your repentance and confession, be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. If you're a Christian that has sinned, has erred by the truth and be restored as a faithful Christian from your faith in Christ after your repentance and confession of sin this time in prayer, ask God to forgive and restore you to a saving relationship with him. Buy the truth and sell it not. If we can be of help to anyone in the audience here today or anyone who's live streaming with us to study further, uh, let us know while we here stand and sing together. <laughs>